Let's open up in a word of prayer, and we'll continue our study in Matthew. Father, once again, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy for all of us here. <clears throat> None of us deserve salvation. We certainly don't deserve to go to heaven, but we thank you for loving us and demonstrating your own love towards us. And while we are still sinners, you went to that cross. You died for our sins. You shed your blood as your only acceptable payment for our sins. And because you rose from the dead, you have given us eternal life. And we thank you and we praise you and we give you all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, turn to Matthew 24. Uh, we left off, you know, looking at that last week of Jesus before the crucifixion. Uh, we saw where what we call Palm Sunday, he rides into Jerusalem on the little donkey. He cleanses the temple, drives out the money changers, flipping over their tables. The next day on Monday, uh, he curses the, the fig tree uh, representing Israel, and no fruit would grow on that fig tree. And, um, and then uh, he cleanses the temple then as well. And then it's sometime on Tuesday that Jesus will have his authority challenged by these religious leaders in Israel. And first he'll be confronted by the Pharisees, then by the Sadducees, and then by the scribes, who were also Pharisees. And what they're all trying to do is trap Jesus in his words so that they, they can accuse him of doing something, saying something that they would say, he's worthy to die. That's their whole purpose. They're just wanting to find him saying something, doing something that they could accuse him of breaking some law, coming against Rome, and, and they'll do that in this section today that we look at. They're going to question him, but chapter 23, uh, I look forward to that one. That's where he pronounces eight woes upon the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, he calls them eight times, pronouncing judgment against them. It's a fun chapter. But it, no, but it's really an amazing chapter. He really puts them in their place. And then that'll be followed by the Olivet Discourse, which is chapters 24 and 25. And that's where he's ministering to his disciples, and he gives them some of the most important prophetic scriptures in the Bible. And so now after Jesus has just given these religious leaders what we saw previously, um, he was using parables to condemn their actions, how they mistreated, the abused, killed the prophets of God. And then he uses that parable where, you know, the, the owner of the vineyard would send his own son. Maybe they'll treat him right and they kill him as well. So now, you know, the people will go on the offensive. They're upset with Jesus. They're going to try to trap him in his words. And you've heard the statement, you know, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Eh. There really isn't anything such thing as a dumb question. If you're truly seeking the Lord, if you're really wanting to know truth, but these guys aren't wanting to know truth. These guys are trying to ask phony questions to try to win an argument, try to manipulate the situation. And so we pick up in chapter 22, verse 15. It says, Then the Pharisees went... And plotted. This is after he gave them the parables. They went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. These guys are really desperate to hold on to their power. They're trying to hold on to their authority. And it's really pathetic here because they're trying to entangle Jesus, the very word of God, with the word of God in order to trip him up. It ain't going to happen. These Pharisees that is mentioned here, these were the ultra-conservative side of leadership in, Jude uh, in Israel. They're the ones who prided themselves in how meticulous they were keeping the law of Moses. These were the guys that would take seeds and you know, say, I'm going to you know, give one seed to God as a tithe. I'll keep nine seeds to myself. I mean, very, very meticulous. Jesus has already shot a lot of holes in their hypocrisy, their misuse and abuse, and their lack of understanding of God's law. And again, Jesus will rip into them in chapter 23. But this whole thing, as we'll see, is a setup. Verse 16, so they're plotting, and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God in truth. 
nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Now, this is interesting because, first of all, we see the uh, Pharisees teaming up with the Herodians. These are two Jewish groups, once again. The Pharisees were very, very nationalistic. It was all about Israel. They could not stand the Roman Empire. The Herodians were Jews that kind of liked having the Roman Empire overseeing them because these guys would bow down to the Romans. They would accept these places of privilege within the Roman government to rule over the Jewish people. And so these two groups hated each other, but they joined forces because they have a common enemy, and that's Jesus. So notice how they try to butter Jesus up. You know, we know that you are true. You know, we know that, you know, you're of God and you teach the way in truth. Be careful. When you hear people trying to butter you up, know that they're after something. You need to have the armor of God on and buckled on tight because they're coming for something. Verse 17, so they say, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, this is one of the ways you know when somebody is trying to manipulate you. Is it this or is it that? We're giving you two choices. Would you rather have high gas prices today or would you rather have high food prices today? Well, wait a minute. I don't want either one of those. And they're kind of interlinked, and they don't want to go into how we can fix this and everything else. It's like, no, this is your choice. They're trying to manipulate the situation here. So is it this or is it that? They think they've got Jesus trapped because they know that if Jesus says, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, the Herodians would run to the Roman officials and say, he's trying to start an insurrection. He's rebelling against the empire. But if he says, yes, pay your taxes to Caesar, then those Jews that did not want the government of Rome overseeing them, they would be like, well, this guy can't be our savior, our Messiah. You know, he needs to kick out the Romans, not give to them. And so again, manipulators will always try and limit your choices. And so these guys think they have Jesus caught between a rock and a hard place. Verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Wow. Now, again, he's on the Temple Mount. It says there's multitudes of people, not just religious leaders, but there's thousands of people gathered there. It's Passover week. Israel's full of people, or Jerusalem's full of people, but there's multitudes on the Temple, and so they're all listening intently to this, thinking, Wow, this guy is putting these religious leaders in their place. You don't do that. But Jesus is not concerned or impressed with people's titles or their positions. He doesn't care if you're called a pastor or a priest or a prophet or anything else. That means nothing to the Lord. He's looking at people's hearts, not their title. And so Jesus says, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? So obviously now they're on the hot seat. They think they got Jesus on the hot seat. Verse 19, show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. This would be a coin you know, that was very common throughout Israel. It was Roman currency, a denarius. that had a, a, a picture of Caesar engraved on it. This was the, the common currency that the people would pay taxes for the Ro Roman Empire. Verse 20, and so somebody brings him a denarius, and he said to them, whose image is this? You know, you can just picture him holding it up, and everybody's looking at him, and whose image is on this? You know, whose inscription, whose picture is on this? Well, Caesar's picture would be on this. So verse 21, they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. In other words, on the coin there's an image, an inscription of Caesar. That means there's ownership. So he is in authority. So you owe him these taxes. You, you render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. You give back 
That's what it means. Render, give back to Caesar the things that are rightfully his. The bigger question that Jesus will deal with here is whose image, whose inscription is on you? It's the Lord. It's God's image. You're created in the image and likeness of God. So we must render to God the things that are His. In other words, first and foremost, we need to render, give back to God what He's entrusted to us. There's ownership. As followers of Jesus Christ, this takes on even more significance because we know Jesus paid the price in full. He paid the price for you. His price was His blood. He shed his blood to purchase you and me off that slave market of sin. We belong to Jesus. We were not bought with empty things, you know, riches of silver and gold, but with the blood of Jesus. This is why the Apostle Paul would say things like this. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 19, Paul writes, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, which belongs to God. So we need to not only render to Caesar, our government, the things that are Caesar's, but we need to render, give back to God all that he has rendered to us. In other words, are we reflecting his image to a lost and dying world around us? Or are we reflecting the image of the world to those around us? Are we, because we've been trusted with the word of God, are we reflecting the word of God, the image of God through his word to those around us? Are we letting the word of God saturate our hearts and minds? God has entrusted us. He's given us His Holy Spirit. He's the one that produces the fruit. So are we living our lives, allowing Him to produce the fruit, giving that fruit away? Love, joy, peace to those around us. Are we yielding our lives over to Him? Or are we still wanting to do our own thing? Are we still just wanting to live in our flesh and not for the things of the Lord? He's given you and me time. He's entrusted time to us. Your time is not your own. Again, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God has given us a certain amount of days. Are we using those days to glorify him or to glorify ourselves? This is what Paul says in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly or carefully in, you know, in this sinful world, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Have you rendered your marriage back to the Lord? In other words, are you doing marriage your way, the world's way, according to the flesh, where there's selfishness, where there's manipulation, maybe there's abuse, or are you doing marriage God's way? where there's love, there's submission to one another, where there's respect and encouragement. So the question is often asked, as Christians, do we need to pay taxes? There are some Christians out there that say, I'm never going to pay taxes. That's Babylon. That's what they'll say today even. So what? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The answer is yes, we do pay taxes. We need to recognize that God is the one who has ordained governments. Romans 13 is very clear. He's the one that raises up governments. He's the one that puts them down. This government at this time where Jesus is speaking was not a good government. There was wickedness everywhere. There was corruption everywhere, but render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. At the same time, our ultimate allegiance belongs to God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who has you know, blessed us with everything. In other words, the Lord and his word are the final authorities. That's the final authority in our lives. So anytime the government says, do something that goes against God's word, we must obey God rather than men. There's a line drawn there. 
God's word is the final authority. Whatever the government says that lines up with God's word, obey. If it says, you have to do this, and it goes against God's word, then you can say, nope, I'm not going to do that. Why do you think persecution has happened for 2,000 years throughout the world as Christians? Why is there persecution happening all over the world today? Because they're not bowing the knee to Caesar. They're not saying Caesar is Lord. They're saying, no, we're living for the Lord. We're trusting God. We're not going to disobey His Word to follow government. So we have to be careful with these things. Anytime the government says, stop speaking in the name of Jesus, you can't stop. Remember when Peter and John were arrested for speaking the name of Jesus? Acts 4.19 through 20 says, because they were telling, they were being threatened, stop telling people about him. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They get rearrested. Because they didn't stop telling people about Jesus. They're disobeying the governing authorities. And so they get threatened again. They get beaten at the end of this. But Acts chapter 5, verse 29, But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. So yes, we're to obey the authorities, except when they try to usurp the authority of God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus. That should be pretty clear. So, he says, Render to Caesar things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Verse 22, When they had heard these words, they marveled, and left him, and went their way. So the Pharisees, they just walk away kind of scratching their heads. You know, they're marveling at how Jesus totally blew away their sure thing argument. We got him trapped. Yes or no, Jesus. And so they thought they had an indisputable question, and Jesus puts them in their place. Now it's the, uh, the Sadducees' turn. Look at verse 23. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him, and asked him, pause there for a second. So the Pharisees are the ultra-conservatives. The Sadducees are the ultra-liberals in Israel's society. These are the theologians that were very, very loose, you might say, with the Word of God. It's noted here, also in Mark and Luke, and then also in Acts 23, 8, that they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in angels. They did not believe in the spirit of man that would live on into eternity. They also did not believe in 34 of the 39 Old Testament books. The Sadducees only believed in the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. This means they rejected all historical books in the Old Testament. They rejected all the prophetical Old Testament scriptures. The funny thing is, they didn't really believe what Moses wrote. They said, we only hold to the Pentateuch. But they didn't even hold to that. And Jesus will put them in their place here in a moment. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy deals with these doctrines that they say they don't believe in. Like the resurrection. Like angels. The eternity of man. And so this is why they're called, what? Sad, you see. <laughs> the sad, you sees. I mean, think about that. They really didn't have any kind of relationship with the God of creation, the miracle-working God who created everything out of nothing. He just spoke it into existence. The miracle-working God that took a handful of dirt and created Adam, breathed the breath of life into him, creates Eve from taking something out of his side, a rib or whatever it may have been. The one who covered their sin when they blew it with lamb skin, probably skins to cover their sin. There's so many miracles and signs and wonders that God did in those first five books. It's amazing. Like preserving Noah and his family and all the animals on that ark when God destroyed the whole world of the flood. I would say that's a pretty big miracle. To beginning the Jewish race with Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob, then the 12 tribes of Israel. And then there's the exodus of the Jews from Egypt, the 10 plagues. 
and they leave, and then they get the Red Sea, and God parts the Red Sea, and then God brings the water back on the you know, Egyptian army and destroys them, giving them manna from heaven every day, giving them water from a rock. That rock that followed them is Jesus, we're told. And yet these Sadducees, they dismissed all these things. But do you know what's equally sad today? There are literally tens of thousands of pastors in our country that don't believe the Bible. Barna just came out with a new report just this past week saying only 37% of all pastors in America believe in a biblical worldview. I mean, 63% of a pa in pastors in America do not believe this is God's word. And this is the final authority when it comes to truth. I mean, how sad is that? We are a post-Christian nation, you would say. I would say. And there's so many people that are coming against God's word. And it's so sad. This is what the Sadducees were doing back in those days. What a wake-up call it will be when the pastors in this country today find out that God's word is true, they missed out on heaven, and that hell is a real place, even though they try to dismiss it. I would not want to be in their shoes. James 3.1 says, Let there not be many teachers among you. You will receive the stricter judgment. I fear for so many pastors that are just playing flippantly with God's Word. They're just twisting things to make their own case. They're just wanting to tickle ears, just like Paul warned us about. So these guys come to Jesus, and I'm sure they're pretty mad at Jesus because it was just a few weeks earlier that he raised Lazarus from the dead. And that was known all over Jerusalem, all over Israel knew about that. And so that kind of goes against the Sadducees' theological point of view. So here we see, again, verse 23, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, and again, they're just trying to trip him up, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. That's out of Deuteronomy. Now there were with us seven brothers. So they're making up this scenario. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, Whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. So they put together this scenario where they're really trying to mock the resurrection. They're trying to make the resurrection look ridiculous. Is this lady going to you know, be married to all seven? Or does she get to choose her favorite when, they, when she gets to heaven? I mean, they're simply mocking the concept of the resurrection. They're totally misapplying what Moses said in Deuteronomy 25, because actually what Moses is talking about here in Deuteronomy 25 is what institutes what we know as the kinsman redeemer. And that was the whole plan. If a husband and a wife, they're married, they don't have any children yet, no sons, and so the husband dies, Moses said, okay, that next brother, if he's single, marries the wife, the widow, and then if they have a son, that first son would truly belong to the dead husband to take on the family name, to carry on the family name. That's what it was all about. So they're trying to make this look ridiculous. There's no resurrection. You know, whose you know, wife would she be? Who would be her husband? So the book of Ruth, that's what it's all about, the kinsman redeemer. Jesus is our ultimate kinsman redeemer. So... This is what we read in Deuteronomy 25, verses 8 through 10. And this is what Moses says would happen if the next brother did not want to marry his sister-in-law after his brother died. It says, Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders Remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, <laughs> and answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house, and his name shall be called in Israel, 
the house of him who had his sandal removed. So definitely one of the more bizarre laws in Israel. So that's where the Sadducees come up with this crazy scenario in order to mock the resurrection, to try to trip up Jesus. You know, in that scenario, if I was the seventh brother, I would probably be like, I don't want to marry her either. I mean, she must be a horrible cook or something. I mean, all my brothers are dropping dead married to this gal, so no way. But anyway, Jesus, he'll now put these Sadducees in their place, and he's going to talk about the resurrection mentioned in the book of Exodus, which they claim to believe in, but he's going to show them, no, you don't. You don't believe this. So verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. So he gives them two reasons why they're mistaken. First of all, you don't know the Scriptures. I would say that's the biggest problem with so many in the church today. They don't know the Scriptures. So many people question God's Word. Well, this can't be, that can't be. They come up with all these weird scenarios like, did you read this? It's all explained right here. Why do you think cults are constantly coming on the scene? And the big established cults like Mormonism, JWs, they take a few verses out of context and they build this whole religious system out of it. You're mistaken not knowing the scriptures. This is why we need to study the whole counsel of God's word. Ephesian, uh, or the, the Paul tells the Ephesian elders, this is Acts 20, starting in verse 27. He says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the, uh, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, the blood of Jesus. We're to go through the whole counsel of God's word. That's why we go verse by verse through whatever book we're in. I mean, I know and I've been in so many churches, and I know a lot of churches, they'll just read one verse, and then the pastor will go on 40 minutes or whatever. Well, no, today it's 20 minutes. You don't want to keep people uncomfortable, make them uncomfortable. They can only handle 20 minute sermon, sermonettes for Christianettes, you know. So we got to be careful that we don't go over 20 minutes. And it just drives me nuts because they'll talk, they'll give one verse and they go into all this stuff that means nothing about the Bible. And then you'll ask them, do you teach the Word of God? Oh, yeah, I use the Bible all the time. There's a difference between teaching from God's Word and teaching God's Word. All Christian pastors, oh, yeah, we teach the Word of God. It's like, are you teaching it or are you just teaching from it? There's a difference. The whole counsel is so important. To the believers in Thessalonica, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. And if you think this is the Word of God, and you know this, and you're standing on this, it says, which also effectively works in you who believe. So if you believe this is the Word of God, it will transform your life. God's Word will change your thinking. God's Word will draw you in line with God's heart, with His mind, because this is His Word. Having that firm foundation that comes from God's Word is what keeps us from getting tossed to and fro with every crazy wind of doctrine that blows through our valley from time to time. And unless you're born again by the Holy Spirit of God, there's no way you're going to understand anything from the Bible. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. But the natural man, that's the unsaved, unregenerate person, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned or understood." In other words, the things of the Lord cannot be understood apart from a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit working in our lives through the Word of God. So Jesus says, you're mistaken not knowing the Scriptures. And then the second thing Jesus said to the Sadducees, you're mistaken because you don't know the power of God. How many people reject God's power to change their life? I've known people over the years, they've been caught up in all kinds of addictions and problems and things, and they try in their own strength to you know, come against it. You can't. But when you surrender to the Lord, the Holy Spirit is so much stronger. He can break any sin, any addiction, any habit, whatever it might be. He can set captives free. That's what He does best. 
So you, he's saying, you don't know the power of God. In other words, if God created the entire universe out of nothing, and he simply spoke it into existence, if God made Adam from the dirt, breathed the breath of life into him, if God you know, has done all these miraculous things that we read about in Genesis and Exodus, I don't think God raising us up from the dead is that big a deal for him. I think it's pretty simple. So you guys don't even know the power of God, he's telling these Sadducees. God's power is on display constantly. Look at this verse, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament or the expanse of heaven shows His handiwork. You know, He's revealed Himself throughout His creation. You can't have a creation without a Creator. Pretty simple. Romans 1.20, Paul says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen. So that which is invisible about God, His attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, and so that they are without excuse. Again, the whole universe, He spoke into existence. We're told in Colossians 1.17 that Jesus is the one who holds everything together. But the day is coming when He's going to release it all, this whole universe is going to vaporize, but then he's going to create a whole new heaven and earth. So, Peter calls the resurrection our living hope. Paul calls the resurrection our blessed hope. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection. How sad, you see. 1 Corinthians 15, this whole chapter deals with the resurrection. Paul says about our future resurrection, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died in Christ, have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. You know, Paul will go on to say, if there is no resurrection, we might as well eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And that's so true. But because there is a resurrection, we know we're going to stand before him. We're going to see him face to face. And so again, he tells them, you're mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Verse 30 for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So he's not saying that we become angels. Some people say, oh, we're going to get our wings when we get to heaven. No, <laughs> we're not going to become angels. He says we'll be like angels in the sense that angels do not procreate. Angels do not marry. Angels are not having little baby angels. That doesn't happen. When God created the angelic realm, He created them all at once. But when one of the chief angels, Lucifer, rebelled, he was kicked out. And Revelation 12 tells us he takes a third of those angels with him. So that's where the demons come from. A third of all the angelic realm are demons to, at this day. Their fate was sealed once and for all. In fact, in Matthew 25, when we get there, we'll discover that Jesus tells us the lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels. But all who reject God will end up there as well. For us, we will not be married in heaven with our spouse. Some of you are thinking, oh, some of you are thinking, ah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> it won't be like the Mormons wrongly believe that you will be up there, guys, with your multitude of celestial wives just having baby after baby. That's what they teach. That's not right either. For us who are saints, who have come to faith in Christ, which is from Pentecost to the rapture, we will be the bride of Christ. And we will experience a relationship with Jesus, the groom, that's infinitely better than anything we could hope for or imagine today. 
So you, we won't be disappointed. I'm not going to be disappointed. I'm not married to Elizabeth anymore. Oh, no, no. It's going to be so much more glorious. And Elizabeth and I will actually have a greater relationship in heaven than we could experience here. We'll have greater relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ than anything we could experience here. So in our limited thinking, we think, oh, it's going to be a bummer. I'm not married to my spouse. Well, no, you're going to be married to Jesus. And it's going to be, again, beyond, more glorious, anything we could hope for or imagine today. So verse 31, he says, But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Uh, again, Jesus is saying for about the fourth time now with these religious leaders, have you not read? Come on, guys, you should know the Bible. Haven't you read these things? God said this directly to you. He spoke these things to you Sadducees, but they were too blind. They are too deaf, spiritually speaking, to hear what God's word said. So he says, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, verse 32, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He's simply quoting from Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, and he's reminding these guys who say, we believe in the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. No, haven't you guys read what Moses said? This is when Moses was standing before God at the burning bush, and that's how God revealed himself to him. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. He did not say, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Jake, uh, Israel. I was the God, or Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. He said, no, I am. It's in the present tense. In other words, Jesus is saying, they're not dead. They're still alive. God's not you know, their God because they're dead. God is still their God because they're alive. We don't die. We don't stop to you know, cease to exist. That's what the Sadducees believed. Once you die, you're just gone. That's it. No more consciousness. So sad, you see. He says, I'm still their God. So in the Old Testament, from Exodus, Jesus is verifying the fact of the resurrection. Verse 33, And when the multitudes, again, not just the Sadducees, but the, when the multitudes, <laughs> multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. In other words, it just blows their minds. The multitudes are probably thrilled that Jesus just stopped the Sadducees in their tracks. But at the same time, this must have just restored their hope in the Lord, that there is life after death, because they've been hearing this for so many years. These religious leaders saying, no, it's useless. Don't even. You know why? Because you're, there's nothing after you die. I mean, and they were just discouraging the people so much. And so now they're thinking, there's something beyond this dirty little sinful planet we're on. Amen. And now because of God's word, and because most of us in here are saved, verses like Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, are just so much more glorious to us, take on so much more significance, because we're seeing this world slip further and further away from us. What does Paul say? For our citizenship is in heaven. You realize we have a dual citizenship. Whatever your address here is on earth, but you're also going to have an address 777 Pearly Gateway in heaven. <laughs> I just made that up years ago. I mean, it's, you have a dual citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. And notice it says, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. Hopefully you are eagerly waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. Don't think, man, my body's getting better and better as the years go on. No, it's not. Second law of thermodynamics is at work in your body, and we are deteriorating, maybe some of us faster than others. When you're young, you think, oh, man, I'm getting stronger. You'll hit it. <laughs> One of these days you'll go, yep, I understand. 
So he will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Remember when we talked about the resurrection, Resurrection Sunday, Jesus in his glorified body could pass through walls. He could still eat, not gain an ounce. I mean, he could just go from here to there as fast as he wanted to. He's going to do that for us. We're going to be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And so, verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, it literally means when they hear that he had muzzled, it's like he put a muzzle on the Sadducees, they regroup. They gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Again, these guys think they can trip up Jesus. Now, don't think of a lawyer in the sense that we you know, think of lawyers, those bloodsuckers. No, that's not what these guys are. These were scribes. These were the guys that would meticulously write down the Bible. They were very important. We praise the Lord for the scribes back in the day because remember when we had the great scroll of Isaiah here? It went the whole length of this stage, and it was amazing. And so a scribe would go meticulously through that. Every time they came to the name of God, and there's a lot of, you know, God in the book of Isaiah, every time they'd, you know, copy that, get to God, they'd go and they'd have to wash their hands and come back. Oh, God's in the same verse another time. Go and wash their hands again. I mean, very, very meticulous. Hebrew um, alphabet is based on a numerical system, and so they would add up every letter and if let's say at the end of this line they'd have the number 99 and so they look at what they were copying from and they go back and count every letter uh oh that says a hundred what would they do with that one that says 99 they'd rip it apart they'd throw it they'd burn it they'd start over that's how meticulous they were in trans you know um transcribing the word of god they didn't just flippantly write things down oh Scratch that out. No, these guys were meticulous. We praise the Lord that they were so meticulous. That's what these scribes are. So they are protectors of the word. Over time, though, they would start arguing with other scribes, with the Pharisees. They were part of the Pharisaical um, group of people. They would argue about which laws were the most important. Now, they're not talking about the Ten Commandments. Here they're talking about the 613 commandments that they had come up with. They just kept expounding on the Ten Commandments. They ended up with 613. 248 of those commandments were affirmative. You shall do this. 365 of those commandments were in the negative, in the sense that you shall not do that. And so they're asking Jesus, which of these two groups is the most important? Are you for the affirmative ones, you shall do this, or are you part of the 365, you shall not do that? So that's where they're coming from. They're asking, what do you think? Which group of laws are the greatest? Again, Jesus wasn't going to take the bait. Verse 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the first thing Jesus does is take them back to the Shema. You're familiar with the Shema. It's something that Orthodox Jews, even to this day, they repeat it. They quote this every single day. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. This is what Jesus is quoting from. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, that's Yahweh, our God, Elohim, the Lord, Yahweh, is one, or Ikad. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Many Jews, even to this day, say this is proof that Jesus cannot be the Messiah. He cannot be God because it says here, God is one. You take a closer look at this verse, and it actually supports the Trinity, the triunity of God. 
It supports the deity of Christ. As we saw back in Genesis 1.1, remember, in the beginning, God created. The word God there is Elohim. It's plural. El is singular for God. Elah is dual. Elohim is plural. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word one here, again, the Hebrew word ikad is a compound unity. It means two or three individuals are one. It's the same word used in Genesis 2.24 when it says that Adam and Eve became one flesh. The two became one, ikad. So it's a compound unity. The Shema actually promotes the triunity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus then quotes Leviticus 19, verse 8, 18, he says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments sum up what the whole Bible is all about. He's not quoting the Ten Commandments. He, he's giving them something more here. That's, that, that's everything. Love God, love others. When we love God with all our heart, then God has our heart. But without Jesus... None of us can love God with our whole hearts because before we're saved, we have a filthy, rotten, sinful heart. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Know what it says? Right there. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, God does, and only He can change it. And so love God. That's the vertical. You love God. Love others. That's the horizontal, right? See the cross behind me? Rick Greta uh, made that. And then just before we left to go to Texas, you know, Emily and Gene were here, and we're trying to figure out how are we going to put these up here. And then we had one over there. We had the dove over here. And they left, and I'm like, I don't like it. <laughs> so I put it like this. You got the cross. Love God. Love others. Jesus says, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. Amazing. As he hung on the cross, he restored our relationship with God, the, the vertical. He restores our relationship with others, demonstrates his own love toward us. And while he hung on the cross, he paid that price that we could never pay. He shed his blood for our sins. He demonstrated his perfect love to the Father and for all of us. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 5, uh, 5, verse 17, in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And so now, how can we love God with our whole hearts? Well, it's only because He first loved us. And He demonstrated His own love. And while we were still sinners, He died for us. Amazing. Now, quickly in this final section here, Jesus will ask these know-it-all Pharisees a question that they will refuse to answer. So again, he turns the tables on them. Verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. So, what do you think of the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? They give the standard answer. Oh, he's the son of David. That's found throughout the Old Testament. The son of David. That's how they looked at the Messiah will be a descendant of David. God gave the Davidic covenant to David that a king would be on his throne forever. Well, obviously, it didn't happen with his natural descendants, but then comes Jesus, who's on the throne of David forever and ever. He's the fulfillment of that. So when Jesus quotes here from Psalm 110, this is what the Holy Spirit inspired David to write. The Lord, that's Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai. So when Jesus asks his second question, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? These religious leaders are speechless. They know what Jesus is asking them. They know what the answer is, but they refuse to answer him. They would have to admit 
something they would not admit, that Jesus is God. Because David would never call an offspring of his Lord, Adonai. So they're like, uh-oh. That's why they were silent. They knew the answer, but they refused to give it because it would be an indictment against them. So they were refusing to admit, as the Bible teaches, Jesus is fully God and he is fully man. Jesus is the creator of David, but he's also an offspring from David. Only one person in human history fulfills being fully God, fully man, and that's Jesus Christ. It's so very important. In fact, in Revelation 22, 16, Jesus says at the end of the book of Revelation, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. He says, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. In other words, as the root, Jesus produced David. He's the creator. As the offspring, again, he was a descendant of of David. And thus Jesus is fully God and fully man. This is why Jesus Christ alone qualifies as the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. No human being could die for your sins. No human being could pay the price to redeem your soul and give you eternal life. Only God, come in human flesh, Jesus Christ, could pay that price. We saw it earlier in Acts 20 where it says, God purchased us with His blood? Well, that's Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, the perfect spotless blood of the Lamb. This is why these religious leaders would not, did not answer Jesus. Earlier in His ministry, He talks to, to these same Pharisees, and this is what He tells them. I'll close with this, John chapter 8, verse 24. Take a look at this. Therefore I said to you, that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, see the he there, it's in italics in the original, meaning it's not in the original Greek. It was added so people could try to understand it better, but it made it worse to understand. Because Jesus is saying, unless you believe that I am, he's, he's using the eternal name of God, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Anybody that ever knocks on our door, either on a 10-speed or driving around, knocking on your door. I always leave them. If you, know, you rarely get anywhere with them. I'll always leave them with that verse. Unless you believe what Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. He is God. He is the only one that came from heaven to earth to lay down his life, to give us eternal life. He died so that we might live forever and ever with him.